Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and I want to welcome everybody to, to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, to tonight's forum. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about Iran, Afghanistan, transatlantic relations, and a whole lot of other topics with our fabulous panel. Uh, the forum tonight would not happen without the co-sponsorship of the Future of Diplomacy Project and the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Tonight's forum is going to be moderated by Nick Burns, the professor of practice of diplomacy in international politics, and as Graham Allison once said, the finest diplomat in the United States of his generation. So please join me in welcoming Nick, and he'll introduce the rest of the panel. Thanks, Jay. Trey, thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with you. What Trey didn't mention is that he's really happy today because his Kentucky Wildcats are NCAA <laughs> basketball championship. So congratulations to Kentucky. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce to you Javier Solana and David Miliband. I'll say a word about both of them in a minute, but I wanted to say this is Europe Week at Harvard University and the Kennedy School because we have two of the senior politicians and international figures in Europe with us for the entire week. So they're in our classrooms. In fact, Javier was in both of my classes today. David will be in my classes on Thursday. Uh, both of them are giving master classes in diplomacy, Iran, Afghanistan. So they're meeting lots of our students. Uh, they're, in fact, they're having dinner, I think, with our European students this evening. So we couldn't be happier that they're Fisher Fellows in our future diplomacy project for the entire week. We're going to have a wide-ranging discussion tonight. We want to talk about the future of the transatlantic relationship, Iran, how to end the war in Afghanistan. We want to think, ask them about how to begin to revive the Middle East talks between the Palestinians and Israelis. And finally, I want to ask them, and they're both friends of America and observers of America, about the United States and our power and where we should be heading in 2012 or 13. Let me introduce both of them to you. Javier Solana, to my left, is certainly one of the senior European leaders of our time and his time. He was, as you all know, the European Union's high representative for common foreign and security policy. In other words, I can say this, he was essentially the foreign minister for Europe and the European Union Secretary General, uh, Secretary General of the Council of the European Union. He dealt with every major international issue. He was the EU's representative in the Middle East talks between Israel and the Palestinians, the quartet. If we had gotten to negotiations with Iran, and we tried mightily in 2006 and 2007, he would have led us, and he would have represented the United States, Russia, China, and the EU in talks to limit and prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear weapons power. He is a senior figure. He has broad experience. He was Secretary General of NATO at the time of the Kosovo War. He led NATO in defending one million Kosovo ethnic um, Albanian Muslims who were in danger of being expelled from the country by Slobodan Milosevic. Before that, he was Minister of Foreign Affairs for S Spain. He is a trained physicist. He is currently president of the, of the Esad Business School Center for Global Economics and Geopolitics. He's a distinguished senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He is the honorary president of the Center for Human Dialogue. He's a senior visiting professor at the London School of Economics. He's a member of the International Crisis Group. He is not retired. He doesn't believe in it. He's one of the most active people I know and a founder of Aspen España recently. So Javier, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. David Miliband, to my left, I think is one of the most impressive and brightest of the young political leaders in Europe. I think he has a great future uh, in European politics and in his own countries politics. He's a member of Parliament, <coughs> Labor Party for South Shields. A lot of you know him because he was Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, the UK Foreign Minister between 2007 and 2010. In that position, he was a very influential leader, I think internationally, on the Iran problem, and we worked together on that problem. A leader on Afghanistan, and I would say a truth teller on Afghanistan. He came here to Boston about a year and a half ago and gave a very important speech at the Kennedy Library on what we had to do to correct our, the deficiencies of our policies in Afghanistan, and a leading proponent of human rights. He was Secretary of State for the Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs, and he led uh, the climate change bill in the United Kingdom, a path-breaking bill. Before that, Minister of State for Communities and Local Government in 2005. Before that, Cabinet Affairs Minister in 2000, 
2004, schools minister in 2002, elected to parliament in 2001, and in the first term of Tony Blair's government, the Labor government, between <coughs> 1997 uh, and 2001, he was head of the policy unit at Number 10 Downing Street, and in opposition between 94 and 97, head of Tony Blair's uh, policy efforts. So he's had a meteoric rise in British politics. We have not heard the last, not by any means, from David Miliband. He was uh, educated at Oxford, at Corpus Christi, and he made a great decision to come here to Cambridge, Massachusetts as a Kennedy Scholar, unfortunately at MIT, but he did very well there, and we're very pleased to have both of them here on this stage. So for the next 40 minutes, we're going to ask uh, Javier and David to go through these six big issues rather quickly, because then we'll get to questions from you, comments from you, and there'll be, I hope, plenty of time for that before we conclude at around <coughs> 725. So gentlemen, Javier and David, first question. Um, you both served at the highest levels of international politics, and you were leaders of the transatlantic community, both committed to NATO. Can NATO and the transatlantic community, Canada, the United States, all the European countries, continue to succeed at a time of real economic crisis and political uncertainty, or ha have we seen the best days of the transatlantic community, or will we see a continued relevance of that community in global affairs? Javier, we can start with you. Well, <clears throat> first of all, let me th thank Nick for your kind words, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be back uh, at Harvard and the Kennedy School. But let me remind you, or remind some of you, that uh, the last time I was here, not the last, one before last, 2003, I had in the audience a student that uh, happens to be today the Foreign Minister of Serbia, Vuk Jeremic, yes, Jeremic was here yeah. in the audience. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the present. Well, the answer, the answer, then. The, answer <laughs> the answer that you have uh, to your question is yes. I think that uh, it will continue. It will be continue to be and strong. It should be. But uh, I think for that we have to do several things. The United States and also the European Union. I think that in the times of turbulence that you have described, more important than ever probably is to have a solid relationship between loyal friends and loyal allies. But again, I do think that you have to, to rethink your relationship with us and we have to rethink our relationship with you. The European Union is going through difficulties, the United States has also its problems, and we have to come out of this situation, of this crisis, we will, and uh, we start a new conversation to get the same, uh, the values that we defend, but in a manner that is adaptable, adapted to the new realities of the world, a world in which uh, power has been shifting around, and uh, I think it will be very important to maintain this relationship. As far as NATO is concerned, I, I'm sure they will continue to exist. I think that the meeting that will take place in Chicago in the coming days, in the coming months, it will be an important one, and it will define a new strategic concept and uh, many other things. I know that Nick has been working on that for, long, for some period of this uh, last month. And uh, I would like to advise, if I, if I can, that one of the most important things that NATO has to do is still is to construct a deeper relationship with Russia. I think that for me, that would be the most important challenge that we have in front of us. Thank you. I, mean, I think the case for European nations and the United States to work together remains very, very strong. We have very strong shared values. I think we also have some strong shared interests, but I think we should look for change rather than continuity in the relationship and, and, and how it operates. Uh, NATO was founded with a very clear, you might call it, geopolitical foe, um, a geopolitical foe who is no longer the main geopolitical uh, foe, without wishing to stray into your politics. Um, the, that project finished in, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think we're still in the post-Cold War phase of thinking about NATO's uh, role and about the transatlantic uh, alliance. We know that we'd move from post-Cold War to something definitive and clear if, when the United States had announced its pivot last year, we had pivoted together. Our pivot to Asia. Yeah. yeah. A transatlantic alliance that was really working in unison and with great clarity would have pivoted together. Because the truth is, we both have to pivot towards 
Asia. It's not just the United States that confronts a different shaped world, so do the countries of uh, Europe. I think that it's also worth just uh, a coda uh, to that. Uh, the United States needs Europe to step up in a very big way. We need to step up in terms of the way we engage with our own neighborhood, including our North African neighborhood, but um, not only that. Uh, and until the European Union is able to fashion a stronger and more coherent view of its own foreign policy, I think the United States is going to struggle to find us the kind of partner that we need to be. And one of the crises, that, the crises that, that we worked on together, the three of us, with a lot of other people in 2007 and 8, was the Iran issue. How do we prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear weapons power? How do we overcome the historical differences between my country and Iran and, and yours as well? And the construct that we fashioned on then is, is, is the same framework that will guide the talks that will begin on Friday, April 13th, when Javier's successor, Kathy Ashton, leads all the countries into nuclear negotiations with Iran. We want a diplomatic solution. We want to emphasize diplomacy. It is backed by sanctions and the threat of force, at least from the United States and some other countries. Is that the right framework to deal with the Iran issue? And do you both believe <coughs> that diplomacy can succeed and we can avoid war? You ask me. Please. I have a long experience of dealing with Iran and failing with Iran. It doesn't mean that we will have to fail. I think we have opportunities in the period of time in which I represented the international community, in which, uh, to my mind, uh, looking from here back, we had at least two moments in which we could have done some progress. Uh, that uh, two moments were lost, not because of our responsibility, but at the end because of a referendum that took place, a referendum by the supreme leader of Iran, uh, something that we had agreed uh, it could not continue. I do think that it's possible to do it with this triangle that you have mentioned. But it seems to me that uh, we will not be able to get a solution, negotiate a solution, unless we get engaged real in the debate, in the, in the negotiation, real in the negotiations. And remember that the United States only participated in one of the thousands of hundreds of meetings that I had, only the last one. Yeah. Uh, Burns, not this Burns, the other Burns, <laughs> uh, was uh, representing the United States. Yeah. Only once. Now it's going to be in all the meetings. So yeah. you have a really a much more powerful representation with, uh, with Iran. Number one. Number two, I think that uh, we have to deal with Iranians accepting that they have rights. And they have rights under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And those rights, we cannot start by denying them. We may have agreements at the end that will be de facto a diminishing of the rights that you have by the non-proliferation treaty. But I think it would be a mistake to restart again asking at the beginning of the negotiation what eventually may want to get at the end. So Iran has a right to civil nuclear power, but certainly not to nuclear weapons, that distinction, right? David. Javier did a remarkable job in trying to lead on this dossier, uh, but I think he undersells himself a bit. One of the things I think it's really important for the students here to understand is that there's a massive difference in diplomacy between failure and not succeeding. It's not the same thing. Yeah. And on the Iran dossier, Javier yeah. did not succeed, but he did not fail. Right. If you accept that diplomacy has failed, then you are committing yourself to a very dangerous course because you are then embracing a non-diplomatic option. Javier did not succeed, uh, but that doesn't mean that he can't succeed or his successor cannot uh, succeed. It's the most fiendishly difficult uh, country to negotiate with. It's uh, very strongly internally divided. The supreme leader lives in the shadows and no one really knows what and how he uh, thinks. Uh, the burden of history lies very strongly not just on its shoulders but in its head and in the head of its people. Uh, which means that there's n you can never say to an Iranian, let bygones be bygones. Uh, they live through their uh, history. And of course, the regime itself is increasingly distant from its own people, failing its own people. And in 2009, the emergence of a new actor on the stage, which was the Iranian people themselves, actually got in the way of the outreach that President Obama was leading at the time to the Iranian government. I think the twin track of pressure and engagement is right. Iran will never do what you want just if you offer them incentives. 
and it will never do what you want if you just offer them sticks. You have to offer both. Uh, I think that the most difficult question for the, for the negotiators, there are two difficult questions, both of which we discussed in the class yesterday. One is how do you balance the <coughs> narrow nuclear question of how Iran fulfills its responsibilities while exercising its rights right. on the nuclear issue? How do you balance that issue with the wider regional question of how Iran, a Shia state and a Shia power, is going to live within a predominantly Sunni Middle East? And that tension between the narrow global nuclear question and the wider regional set of issues seems to me to be the first difficulty. The second most difficult question is about the sequencing of the di discussion on the nuclear issue and how do the questions are, I mean, for, at the most obvious level, do you start by discussing Iran's responsibilities or do you start by discussing Iran's rights? And from that moment, you've got a whole series of very difficult sequencing questions. And the real challenge, I would say, for the next 18 months is for the talks not to collapse. If in 18 months' time, the talks are substantive and real and ongoing, that will be a great success not least because I think in circumstances of ongoing talks, it's very hard for, uh, for Israel, which is the obvious third party in this, to exercise a unilateral military option. Right. And that's very important. So uh, two quick follow-ups on Iran. This is such an important issue, and I think we'll have lots of questions on it. Um, President Obama, about three weeks ago, made the clearest statements to date of his presidency on his Iran policy. He said that he did not believe in containment, that he wanted to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. He wasn't willing to live with a nuclear-armed Iran. He said he, did, he was willing to use force under certain circumstances. He said he had Israel's back. He effectively, as I saw it, tacked to the center, closer to the Israeli position. But he did one other thing in the three or four days surrounding the AIPAC conference. He made an impassioned plea for time and space for diplomacy. It was one of the strongest statements I've heard him make in foreign policy. He said, we've got to exhaust diplomacy. Was that helpful, do you think, in maybe inviting a more open and cooperative Iranian response at the beginning of these talks, or is it just too hard to tell? I don't think you should see the, uh, President Obama's speech and his actions in terms of how close he is or is not to Israel. There is absolute alignment, it seems to me, between not just uh, the US and Israel, but between European countries and Israel, and actually, if you push them, the Russians and the Chinese, Iran will not become a nuclear weapon state. That alignment is very clear, and I think it's a mistake to start judging um, the speech in terms of whether or not he moved towards Israel or not. What he did was he reframed the Iran question in a very significant way. For the first time ever, the red line has been very clearly painted, namely Iran will not become a nuclear weapon state, and the trigger for, new, for uh, military action has been very clearly set out. Namely, when it becomes an, if it becomes a nuclear weapon state, I will take it out, he said. So no one should be in any doubt whether you're in Iran or elsewhere about America's determination to make sure that it doesn't become a nuclear weapon state, but equally, America's determination to pursue every conceivable option until there is no alternative to a military option. And I think that, clar that the lack of clarity about that has bedeviled diplomacy up till now. I think the insertion or the assertion of clarity in the speech and in the Atlantic interview are very significant. But I don't think it's about whether or not he's close to Israel or not. It's not a bilateral dispute between Iran and Israel. It's a dispute in which Israel has a very significant stake, but it's not a bilateral dispute. It's a global question, not just a, a bilateral question. But you can understand for the United States, it's, a, it's very important that we have an identity of views with Israel. And there has been a separation, I think between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Obama. But Javier, what are your views on I, this? I think that uh, the question uh, of Iran is not uh, bilateral or trilateral, as uh, David has said. It's a multilateral problem. Iran with nuclear weapons is a problem to everybody, uh, to Saudi Arabia, to Egypt, uh, to many countries which are close and others which are far away. The important thing to my mind now is to really see how we can handle the bilateral, I mean, the, the multilateral negotiation, and at the same time take into consideration the evolution in the region. Syria is going to be a very important part of the negotiation. 
if Syria at the end of the day comes out in a situation that breaks with Iran, the situation will be completely different for the negotiations. So I think we have to follow at the, at the same time the bilateral negotiation with them by the international community and at the same time watching very carefully the evolution in the region. If we see, if Kathy Ashton, your successor, is able with all the other countries and Iran to keep these negotiations going for the next several months, are we effectively in a diplomatic period where there's very little chance of the use of force by Israel? Well, I think that uh, if we have, uh, we start a negotiation and uh, during the process of negotiations, I think it will be a tremendous mistake to, to, to do anything else. If we are negotiating, we are negotiating. And uh, we have to give time to negotiate. It's absurd to think that in three months we are going to have a solution to the problem that uh, lasts for many, many years back. So if anybody thinks that uh, we are going to, well, the negotiators are going to solve the problem in, uh, in a question of months, uh, months, uh, two or three months, I think there's a mistake. We better not start. We have to give sufficient time to really be able to make the points and to, to, to to get the possibility to give a chance to real negotiation. It will be very difficult, very, very difficult. The mistrust is very profound. And uh, we have to let the negotiators uh, space and time. Let me just um, uh, come in on that, uh, because I'm sure someone will ask, uh, let me anticipate a question, which is, um, isn't there a danger that if we start advertising that this is going to take a long time, that the Iranians will play for time, right. play out the enrich time. like crazy while the, the clock ticks, mm -hmm. yeah. and actually leave the international community, mm -hmm. including Israel, in a very, very difficult position. Yeah. Uh, the, I think that's a very, very good question. And there needs to be both um, leverage and patience. Patience alone will induce the Iranians to make a fatal miscalculation, which is that they can simply string this out. So there's got to be leverage as well as uh, of patience, because if there isn't, then I think we'll end up in a very dangerous situation. So we'll see both diplomacy and also sanctions continue and not so subtle pressure, is what you're saying. Yeah, and, and I think that the starting point for the discussion has got to be making, and, and, and the, the, the fact that the Chinese and the Russians are, are there as well means that the pre preparations are incredibly important. Yeah. The Iranians have got to understand that uh, they can end up exhausting the space they've got to find a diplomatic solution. And that, I think, is one of the advantages of what the president has done. Equally, he said, don't rush to war. I, I often hear people talking about a strike on Iranian military installations or nuclear installations. This is incredibly dangerous. It makes it sound like sort of taking out an appendix or something. The, uh, what we're talking about is a, a, a series of strikes with a series of responses, which if you war game them through, involve very significant risk of wider conflagration. So I think we should, what we are talking about is whether or not you want to have a war with Iran, not a strike on Iran. Right. And that, I think, dramatizes the stakes that are uh, <clears throat> at issue in this, in this set of talks. Thank you, this is very helpful. I'm confident we'll come back to Iran in the question and answer period. Um, we have been in Afghanistan, Britain and the United States, fighting for ten and a half years. NATO joined that effort in 2003. For a long time, our belief was that we could win, in essence, a, with the Afghan government, a conventional victory, that the Taliban wouldn't return. We've been disabused of that. And now I think it's clear to everybody there is no conventional victory. So the question I want to ask both of you is, where does this war end? And does it end in a negotiation? between the Afghan government, the Taliban, the regional countries surrounding Afghanistan, and some of the other great powers like China and the United States, is that what it's going to take to bring all of our troops home at some point? Because I frankly can't even see the horizon for a total withdrawal of American troops. Javier. Well, um, I think that uh, when we talk about, about Afghanistan, the temptation is to, to analyze the past and to say how many mistakes we have made, etc. I would not enter into that, but uh, we have to recognize that we have made a tremendous number of mistakes in, the, in dealing with Afghanistan. Now, supposedly that we are at the situation that we are today, 
with the President Karzai, with the capacity that he has today, uh, with uh, negotiation, which I still do not know exactly what is going on uh, publicly with the Taliban, there's, there's rumors, but uh, we don't know exactly, at least I don't know exactly what is the situation, which I'm pretty sure. There will not be a manner in which we go, we leave Afghanistan in a dignified manner without an agreement with the regional powers. I mean, there are countries in the region that has much more interest in the stability of Afghanistan than us. And we have to give them the, the chance to do it and to, 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 to help in that direction. I mean, at the end, uh, uh, Tajikistan and, and, and China and India and, and, and Pakistan, they have much more interest in the stability of Afghanistan than we do. So without an agreement with these countries uh, in the way of, of leaving, it will be very difficult to, to, to really leave in a dignified manner because we left behind a mess uh, bigger than the one we found. So really, I, I, I claim a long time back that a, a global I mean, regional conference or a regional scheme should be put in place a long time back, I think. By the way, that would have been another manner of dealing with Iran, with another door. Right. It could be an, an entree. You remember that in Bonn, when we started yeah. in Bonn, at the beginning of the conflict with Afghanistan, we had at the table Iran. We did. In Geneva, we had at the table Iran. So it's a, it's a big, a big... Uh, I, mean, uh, yeah. I don't know how many of you read the Boston Globe today. On the front page, there's a picture of a boy who's lost his father in Afghanistan. He's an American uh, boy. His father did something incredibly brave to save an Afghan child and got killed in the uh, process. The only time I ever see Afghanistan getting reported is when soldiers get killed. It's become the forgotten war. And for you, you've got 120,000 troops there. Mm -hmm. We've got 10,000. Uh, troops there, and the uh, scope for the West to leave with enormous damage both to its reputation and to its interests is very, very real. And I think we're at a very perilous moment because we're almost reaching the stage when so many of the players there have given up on us that they're just waiting for us to leave and we're on the slipway to a very, very undignified and dangerous uh, exit. What do we know? We know that you can't kill your way out of a counterinsurgency. We know that no government in Afghanistan's history has ever governed the country from Kabul. We know that the state in Afghanistan will never have a monopoly on violence in that country. We also know that it is a country of 40,000 villages and valleys with enormous diversity from Herat in the west on the Iranian border up to Mazari Sharif <coughs> in the north, round to Kandahar and Helmand in the uh, south, uh, south and east. And so that says to me that we have to get a negotiator sanctioned by the UN Security Council, drawn from the Muslim world, appointed now to talk to all sides on two tracks. One, internally, all the tribes need to be in the solution. And remember, the insurgency, if you talk to um, Michael Semple here, who knows more about this than anybody else, there are at least nine different branches to the insurgency. It's not just the Taliban. There are nine different uh, parts of it. But you've got to talk to all of the different factions in the country for an internal political settlement. And the tragedy is that in Bonn in 2001-2, the vanquished were kept out of the peace conference, so-called. Secondly, you need, as Javier said, a regional uh, side to this, because... All of the ethnic groups in Afghanistan cross borders. It was one of my predecessors who drew the line 2,500 kilometers between Afghanistan and Pakistan. A long time ago. A long, uh, well, not that long, 1919, 1920. And um, you know, Bertrand Russell said that anything after 1900 was family history. So uh, the, uh, not, not that long ago. Um, and all of the, uh, right around the country, there are these groups that cross the border. And let me just say one other thing. Uh, Pakistan is absolutely key to the future of uh, South Asia. And this is a, a South Asian crisis, not just an Afghan crisis. I think it's important. To, that, that I'm sh I just looking around the room, I can see there are people here from South Asia, probably people from Pakistan as well. Mm. The most dangerous thing I ever hear when I come to the United States or click on to 
your newspapers is people saying America would be better off if it cut its links with Pakistan. That would be an absolute disaster. I mean, the, the only thing worse than continuing to have a, basically a military relationship with Pakistan where you uh, give them F-16s is to cut off completely. And Pakistan's tragedy is that for 30 of the last 62, 63 years since independence, it's had a military uh, regime. It needs friends in the West who are supporting its economic and social and political development, not cutting off from it. And that is actually the heart of the, the geostrategic challenge you continue to face from, we continue to face from Al-Qaeda. So the problem that the um, international governments have is that, um, mic's not working, thank you. The problem that we have internationally is that the U.S. is trying to negotiate with the Taliban, and yet we've announced a withdrawal of NATO forces by 2014, and so uh, is the Taliban simply going to wait us out and continue to fight a military battle after the preponderance of European forces leave? Well, the answer to that is yes, but they would have done that even if you hadn't announced a date. Uh, I mean, the tragedy at the moment is we've got an end date, but not an end strategy. An end date, but not an end game. And the sooner we get an end game, the better, because fewer people will get killed in the interim, both Afghans and uh, Western uh, forces. Now, my own view is, remember, the Taliban want us out, and we want to get out. So there is actually some common ground to work on. It's important to go back to basics in this. And in the end, it's not Afghanistan that is the geostrategic, um, right. explosive country there. It's Pakistan that is. And so I think it, the, the West should be very clear about what its bottom lines are. And the bottom line is that Afghanistan will not be a, become an incubator for global jihad again. But, and there are bottom lines in respect of some of the social progress that's been made, although, frankly, some of it is, is honored more um, in, 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 in the breach than in the observance. But nonetheless, there has been some progress on girls' education and uh, things like that. But frankly, we're going to just have to set out our minimum bottom lines. Others will set out theirs. And the truth is, with only 18 months or two years of... Um, combat operations to go, we've got declining leverage to assert those. But the sooner we start a serious negotiation where you try and find common ground, the better. And Javier, the other difficulty is... The other, dif the other difficulty is that the United States actually is going to stay after the Europeans leave. We've got to train the Afghan National Army and be present, not on the streets, but on bases for counter-terror operations on the border. So we're not leaving. How is this all going to play out? How do you look at this? Well, I think what, uh, what is leaving is probably is NATO, which I think is the moment in which it has to leave. And the United States may stay, and therefore the Europeans and the Canadians will leave. Some of them are already leaving. So I think it will be better to, to get uh, the decision that NATO leaves and the American after the 2000X, whatever is the date that is placed. But I, I agree with uh, David that uh, we don't have uh, an exit strategy, although we have repeated uh, thousands of times that we had one, but we don't have it. And if we do have it, we have not, this, we have not put it to work. I think that uh, it's time to get the regional conference in place, appoint somebody, give him the support, give him the support, because we have appointed somebody. And remember that we had uh, a very good uh, UN representative there that, uh, that failed. Oh, no, because we're also of the lack of, of support by everybody. So I think that this is very important to do it rapidly. 2014 is tomorrow. But look, you're going to have to also do some very painful things. I mean, at the moment, um, there are a series of night raids against the Taliban taking people out who are then replaced. One of the absolute basics to get any kind of confidence, and they've set up this office in Qatar, is the deal is we'll stop the night raids if they stop the roadside bombs. That's a, that's a very difficult thing to say and do, but it's essential. Because unless you're able to build that kind of, uh, I don't like to call it a confidence-building measure, it's actually a, a life preservation measure for our troops, and, uh, then you're, you're never going to get beyond this um, uh, shooting war, which you can't win. I mean, remember, every single person in the US and British military is now trained to say and believe that there is no military solution in a counterinsurgency. I mean, David Petraeus said to me the first time I ever went to uh, Iraq, there is, we can't kill our way out of this problem. And he's right. But the logical corollary of that is you have to find a non-military solution. That doesn't mean you pull out all your troops tomorrow, because that would 
I think, create the conditions for an even worse civil war than there is at the moment. But you're, we're going to have to do some very, very painful things. And part of the truth-telling is that that is better than having more stories like you've got on the front of the Boston Globe today. Okay, we'll come back to this as well. Two more quick questions before we go to questions from the audience. One is on Europe and one's on the United States. You're both European leaders. You've come through the worst economic crisis in the history of the Eurozone. It has, it has spawned a political debate about the organization of Europe, the future of a united Europe. Are we going to have to see, will you have to produce in Europe, a stronger Europe in Brussels relative to the member states to provide a structure for the Eurozone to be able to succeed in the future? Am I right or wrong about that? And, and how is the debate going as you see it? Well, from my point of view, you are right. I think the outcome of this crisis in the European Union cannot be any other, any other direction than more uh, integration. That doesn't mean that uh, the nation state is going to lose all the uh, prerogative in the, in the integration. But there's no doubt that, uh, without, that uh, the solution of this problem can be, can be done without more integration. Therefore, the question of sovereignty is a question that we have to think about. That sovereignty is an old, goes back to Westphalia. I mean, this is, it's impossible to run the world of today or to live in the world of today with the concept of nation state as, uh, as used uh, in Westphalia. Therefore, giving sovereignty is something which is going to be normal. And in fact, we do it every day. Don't recognize that, but uh, when we get an agreement in WTO, and we, we give some sovereignty away. So, but we have to do that much more clearly in the European Union. I don't see any other way out than more integration. I'm sorry, um, David may not agree with me, but uh, the British and the Europeans sometimes we do not agree on some issues. Well, I, um, no, I mean, uh, look, the economics all points in one direction which is in respect of the Eurozone, which you asked about, 17 members of the Eurozone, 27 members of the European Union, the economics all points towards closer integration within the Eurozone. However, the politics all points in the opposite direction. Because not just in Britain, but elsewhere, there is a strong feeling of desire for a looser set of arrangements, both in creditor and in debtor countries. Now, I think it's inevitable that you're going to have to have a tighter union within the Eurozone. I don't welcome the fact that that's going to mean Britain is further um, sidelined, but I think that's the consequence. I don't think that's good for, the, for Europe, but I think that's going to happen. And the uh, danger is that the Eurozone <coughs> turns inwards, doesn't just become tighter. It turns inwards on trade policy. It turns inwards on a, a series of other reforms that are going to be very, very important. Now, um, Spain is suffering 50% <coughs> youth unemployment. What's extraordinary is that there isn't more revolt about what they're going, the, the austerity that they're uh, going through. Um, but the, the, the government that's replaced the one that Javier supported is implementing a completely suicidal economic policy. I mean, they're in the middle of a desperate recession, and they're slashing public spending to the tune of 3.5%, 4% of GDP. Uh, and they're uh, going to end up in a situation where they come from bailout after bailout, but austerity on its own is not a economic policy, as you have shown in this country by having a, a, a much more sensible short-term approach to, demand, to management of demand. If you haven't got any demand in your economy, you've got no growth. But you've David, got no growth, you can't reduce your deficit. But David, the, the, the question was uh, posed to, to us, I think, is that the, the outcome will be more integration or less integration. I disagree with you. I think on, on the conclusion you draw from the statement that you make, you said that, that you will welcome more economic integration. But at the same time, you see less political integration. My point is that this is impossible. The moment you get more economic integration, you will have to be followed by more political integration. Yeah, I didn't express and myself. That is the only, the only way. This is uh, the only manner that has been always and continued to be. It's impossible to have more economic integration and not integrate politically because you have to talk about taxes, you have to talk about so many things which are strictly political, and you have to really go into the political side, also integrating much more. Yeah, uh, Javier, let me, uh, let me uh, put it this way. The economics points towards more integration, but the politics pulls towards less. That's the point I'm making. Mm. 
Not that, not that somehow you can have more economic integration without more political integration. But this push and pull has to win both an integration. But what's interesting and odd is that the, the country which, that Germany is standing in the way of the economic integration that is essential. I mean, the, the story of the last two years has been of the German government standing in the way of euro bonds, closer um, confederation in, within the eurozone. That's the truth of the last two years. And the problem has gone from being a 50 billion euro problem to being a one and a half trillion euro problem. That's actually what's happened. So it's not that we disagree on what economic integration means, it's that the politics is inhibiting it. I think it may be inhibited now, but uh, the moment that this situation will evolve, it will evolve uh, in, a recent, in a recent period of time, the economic integration will bring along the political integration. And that is a problem because we will have the Eurozone much more integrated than the European Union. And that is a problem for the relationship with a country like yours, for instance. And I understand that problem. Let's come back to this in the Q&A. We have a lot of European students here this night. I know they'll ask about that. Final question. We had Secretary of State James A. Baker III here at Harvard uh, last week. He's an extraordinarily impressive guy. He's got, he, is, he ran five presidential campaigns. He's a great political mind. He was also arguably our most successful Secretary of State of the last 30 years. One of the takeaways from his 10 hours with us here at Harvard was this. He's worried about the United States. He's worried about our governance. Uh, worried about the ability of our two political parties to make very tough decisions about our economic future that would sustain American power in the world. You're both very close observers of the U.S., your friends. Are you worried about us? Are you worried about America <coughs> leading with purpose in, in the future? Well, I'm worried about America because I like America. Thank and, you. Um, and as an honest citizen from Europe, a global citizen, I think that the role of America in the, in the global politics is fundamental, fundamental for a long time to come. <coughs> Therefore, when I see the polarization in the country, when I see a debate television, one, two, three, four, five, I don't know how many, because you have many debates, nonsensical, but many debates, many debates. And you talk about everything, with the exception of the problems that really matters today is, is something really very frustrating. Very frustrating. This is the most important country in the world. It will continue to be. And uh, the impression you give to an ordinary citizen of the world after seeing the leaders of the world, the, well, leaders, or parts of the leaders uh, discussing things that have nothing to do with the solution of the economic crisis, etc., etc., is really very, very troublesome. And, and if that is the type of United States we're going to see so polarized, so in, unable to get to, to consensus, unable to look at the problems and resolve them in a reasonable period of time. Second thing I would like to say is that we have in the world of today, in the complicated world of today, a political cycle to my mind which is too short. I mean, in a way, this political cycle in the world today is fixed by the political cycle in the United States. And after the first by elections, after the president is elected, the whole thing changes. And the Obama pre-Congress pre by, by elections is uh, different from the Obama two years, I mean, after that uh, election. So everything is very complicated to handle. When other countries like China and India and Brazil are planning, are doing things with a much more uh, capacity to do, to, to have a time in their side. I think that this is a big problem. The lack of uh, capacity for consensus, the polarization, I hope that the polarization doesn't arrive also to the, to the tribunal, to the, to the Supreme Court, and, um, and also the time in which we, we, we handle problems at a rhythm that is not uh, compatible with the level of problems that we have in a globalized world. Well, it's a bit rich for Europeans to complain Given, given how brilliantly we're dealing with our own problems, to come and complain about uh, how you're dealing with uh, yours. But um, I think that the, uh, the I, I'd reframe the question as follows. America's <coughs> position in the world is going to change dramatically in the next 30 years. As dramatically as when it was a rising power to, to take over from Britain as the world's superpower. And the world is going to have 
a different economic balance of power in 30 years' time. And that requires a process of adaptation that is very, very difficult for any nation to um, walk its way through. It's particularly difficult for a nation whose political system is designed to check executive power rather than facilitate it. So if you think about the wrenching changes that you need to make in your social security system, <clears throat> in your economic focus, you can think about it, um, in your energy infrastructure, in your oil dependence, etc. <clears throat> uh, your system of government isn't designed to facilitate those big shifts. And I think that's the governance challenge that you've got in a context where the, the relative balance of power <coughs> is going to shift very, very profoundly in the next 30 years. And so it's not a, I don't know if it's a question about worried, because I think the uh, rejuvenating capacities of this country are very, very strong indeed. But I think that, there is a, um, that there's a frenetic gridlock at federal level that incapacitates you in, in a pretty profound way, and I think that's what you, you're going to have to think through. Thank you. I wish we could continue this. We're going to go to questions. You know, usually talk of decline and collapse of empires takes place at Yale. Um, <laughs> I believe, and, I, and thank you for reframing it, I believe the United States will be the most significant power, global power, 30 years from now. But it all gets back to Baker's question, can we deal with our economic problems because that's the source of our military and political power? It's a fascinating subject to discuss. I think we'll go to questions. We haven't addressed the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I'm sure someone will ask about it, including my friend Sid Topol, seated in the front row. But we've got microphones here on the floor in the aisleways. We've got microphones on the balconies here. So um, just a couple of um, words of advice. Please identify yourself. Let us know what you're studying if you're a student. And please make sure that your very brief cogent question has a question mark attached to the end of it. Please. Uh, my name is Ben Bolger, and I'm an alum of Harvard. Um, I have a, uh, a question. It, it's very clear that um, during the Cold War, there was a very uh, clear focus for the purpose of NATO. Uh, in this kind of post-Cold War environment, it seems that the United States continues to be very economically involved in supporting NATO and also uh, supporting the military infrastructure in NATO. Given our own country's economic woes, is it still appropriate for the United States to be as involved or over-involved in NATO, or should there be a re-scaling of the balance? Javier, you're a former that, Secretary That is General. not a question for me. It's a question probably for you. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, I'm not going to define what is the involvement of the, the United States in NATO. I think that without an engagement of the United States in NATO, NATO probably will not exist. Now, how much should others put uh, their shoulder also? Yes, and it's our obligation to do it. Um, I'd like to, to use the terminology, of, to comment on the terminology that has been used when we talked about uh, Libya, leading from the back and others being at the front, but helping from the front to, helping from the, from the front to those who were leading from the back. So it's a quite a confusion, okay? But uh, without the leading of the United States, none of these operations would have been done. I, I think you can closest. scale back, because when, when Nick was um, U, U.S. ambassador to NATO, how many American troops were there in Germany? Oh, there were probably at that, that time, I don't know, 50 or 60,000 American yeah, troops. Yeah, so uh, there's, there's room for massive shift, <coughs> because the purpose of NATO has fundamentally changed. And NATO is much less concerned, obviously, for... Uh, intra-European uh, relations. Its relations with Russia is very important, but I don't see that as a military uh, confrontation in anything like the same way. No, no not a military No, I know you're it's not saying that. You're saying it's about... Uh, and it's as much for the European Union as it is for NATO to fashion a relationship with uh, Russia. So I think there can be a rebalancing. It should cost you less, but I still think it should be a useful instrument for you. And I would just say thank you. It's a very good question. President Obama is going to host the NATO summit in Chicago in the third weekend of May. I think what he is saying, and I very much support him on this, is that NATO is in our absolute interest. We can't be isolationist and we can't be unilateralist. We've got to be engaged. If we didn't have NATO, it sounds trite, we would have to invent it. Canada and 26 European allies all together, and we've seen how valuable it can be. But we're shouldering too much of the burden. 
and the Europeans are not spending as much on national defense as they should. And it's proper for the United States to keep on that issue and expect that Europe will be a more balanced partner. So thank you for that question. Joel. Um, hi, my name is Joel Brownald. I'm a grad student at the Kennedy School and a student of Professor Burns. Around the, the diplomatic circuit today, you hear the concept that time is running out for the two-state solution. Can you tell us when does the stop, when does the clock stop, and what happens next? On the two-state solution, mm -hmm. I think that the clock should not stop ever. I think the two-state solution is the only solution. When we talk about the one-state solution, or those who talk about one-state solution, they don't want to solve the problem. And um, I think that uh, a one-state solution will, leave, uh, will lead to much, many more problems than a two-state solution. Therefore, we have to put to work seriously, seriously, which we haven't done in a year, or over two years, and uh, trying to bring peace uh, within the two-state solution. I, uh, uh, Joel knows I think this is the biggest diplomatic failure in 60 years. Joel uh, did some extraordinary work with an organization called One Voice, which is a citizens' movement in Israel and in Palestine, brings together Israelis <coughs> and Palestinians to try to um, take action to build bridges uh, between peoples because mm. the consent among the two peoples has, and, and the trust amongst the two peoples in the process has declined uh, massively. And frankly, if you said to me, I want you to bet your, bet your mortgage on there being a two-state solution in your lifetime, I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that we should give up trying, but it seems to me that mm. it's not just enough to say, let's keep on with the same old, quote-unquote, peace process because it's lost all credibility. It seems to me there are two conditions for getting this thing done. Remember, the Arabs rejected it in the 1940s. Israel's rejected it at different points in its uh, history, so um, no one comes out of this uh, smelling of roses. The, uh, it seems to me there are two conditions to get this done. One is that this has got to be a regional settlement between Israel and the Arab world. It's not just about Israel and the Palestinians. Mm. Now, we're about to mark, I can't remember the exact date, the 10th anniversary of the Arab Peace Initiative, I think this month. Yeah. The Arab Peace Initiative was launched in Beirut in 2002, and it said all the countries of the Arab League will recognize Israel and establish diplomatic relations with Israel in the event that a Palestinian state is created. So it was about Israel living, having security within its neighborhood. Um, and I think that's essential. The second is a much more tricky thing to, to say, but let me try and say it diplomatically. I think that if we expect America to be the sole midwife of this pregnancy, then it won't, it won't end well. Uh, you mentioned James Baker. Remember the Madrid conference was an international effort, not just a U.S. effort. Javier was there. He was the host. Mm -hmm. you were, were you the foreign minister at the uh -huh. time? Or the... I was there, yeah. yeah. So it seems to me that we have to regionalize the solution. It's an Israel-Arab solution. But we also have to internationalize the effort. Because, I mean, bluntly, American politics plays too big a role in the uh, <clears throat> process if it's not an internationalized effort. So, you know, please let me say, say a word about uh, the Arab initiative. <clears throat> I was in Beirut at that time. I, I worked very hard in the, with the Jordanian minister to write part of it. Uh, I think has a, a problem inside, which is all or nothing. Mm -hmm. The Arab initiative should have the possibility of a step followed by a step. But it has to be the whole step for the whole recognition. And I think that makes the whole thing very um, un unhelpful because then you have to resolve the problem in order to resolve the problem. <laughs> and this is a petition of principle. So you have to, and this is what we tried to do in the last period of time, trying to convince both sides that they have to respond positively to any step taken by any of the two sides. And that will create the mechanism, the dynamics, to go all the way to the end. Now, I agree that uh, the peace process with the quartet in the classical manner, it will not be possible to be done. I said this afternoon, and you listened to me when I said it, that it will be impossible, on the other hand, to think that by leaving the two parties alone, they will find a solution. The unbalance of the two parties, once they occupy, they are occupied, it's impossible that they can solve the problem alone. 
they will need some kind of help. That help should not come should not come only from the United States, but the United States will be very, very important in relation with Israel. But the countries of the region, and in particular with the region of change, it should be a fundamental element also to create a catalytic effect. Um, Javier and I taught my class today, Modern Diplomacy, on this issue, the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. Mm -hmm. David will join that class on Thursday. Where we came out today, I'll just speak for the two of us. I think what the two of us came out were the, uh, two things. One, that a two-state solution is vital and necessary. That Israelis and Palestinians must share the historic land of Palestine. And that a one-state solution would deny the Jewish basis of the state of Israel. And that is untenable for Israelis. They will not agree to it. And many of us, including myself, would never agree to that. Second is that the current peace process is not working. It's failed, as David has said, miserably. And that, the, David, you're right. The United States needs help from the European Union and certainly from the Arab world and more vigorous Arab participation in reaching out to the Israelis and strengthening the Palestinians. So there's a long way to go here on a very complicated Yeah, but you see, look, look, think about this. I mean, uh, I've always made the argument it's in Israel's interest to, for there to be a uh, two-state solution, da 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 But actually, if you're sitting in Tel Aviv at the moment, why do you think it's in your interest? I mean, it's, y your economy's booming. Uh, your wall has reduced terrorist activity, bombings, etc. Um, it's a very narrow strip of land, but um, the, the West Bank feels a long way away. Now, I say this with no sort of um, pleasure, but essentially the, the, the attempt to change the quote-unquote facts on the ground has been pretty successful. And it was an attempt... You can, you can ascribe whatever motives you like to it. But I think that um, part of the issue <clears throat> is that, the, that, that the, happy, the happy argument, look, it's in both sides' interests, is seriously doubted, certainly within Israel, mm -hmm. by significant sections of the uh, population, because they fear that the wrenching costs of change, including moving hundreds of thousands of their fellow citizens out of the occupied territories in the West Bank, um, isn't going to be worth the candle. So that's my fear. That's part of this loss of consent. I think one's got to look that pretty starkly in the face. And, and I would say that Israelis need to reflect upon the fact that Palestinian rights cannot be denied forever. That there's a question of justice here for the Palestinians. I think that's the Israeli self-interest, to recognize that they cannot occupy the West Bank forever. It's, it's not tenable. Well, I mean, I, that's a, I, I make that argument, but in response, what, the argument that comes in response is, yeah, but every time we pull out of uh, territory, we end up getting rockets. And so people like you and me who want a two-state solution, we've got to think, what's the security? It's the security issue that at the moment is the trump card for the right in Israel. And we've got to think, what's the answer to that security conundrum? Because the narrative is, every time we pull out, things get worse. Well, the United States has been that, that, that a very is, good friend. I, I disagree with ahead. that. I don't, I don't agree that every time that we pull out... Uh, no, but that's the argument. It, I'm not saying I agree with it, but, but that's the but, argument. But this made. is not an argument. It's a fact that doesn't correspond to that argument. It's not an argument. It's a lie. Um, and I don't think that this is a serious thing. I mean, I, that is not true. And I think, honestly, when you say, Dave, that somebody is in, in Tel Aviv doesn't care because he lives comfortably in Tel Aviv, he goes to the music, and goes to the beach, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is a statement that uh, is very complicated to, to, to accept. If you go to Kalkia, if you really close for every Israeli to see what is going on in the, in the lines of crossing, if you don't see that, then you really are blind. And the people in Israel don't want the people of Israel to see that. And if you don't see that, you don't see anything that the people in the, the Palestinians are suffering. If you go to Kalkilia and try to cross, I mean, I've done it uh, walking. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, big, big thing, big, big, big thing. And that happens to everybody, up to many people, every day, every day. I think, I think we cannot uh, um, diminish the, 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 the case for the Palestinians, which have been, I think that the life of uh, an Israel, Israeli, is valued 
many more times than the life of a Palestinian. And this is really unfair. We will never have a world in which I would like to live where this, the life of a citizen of a country is more valuable, 10 times more valuable than the life of somebody. David, David last can, word. Of course I agree with that. Of course I completely agree with that. The, the, the issue is not the passion with which we bring to the justice of the cause. I didn't put any passion. The, 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 question, the, 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 the question is what's actually happening on the ground. And one of the rules I have is there should be no, you, can never have, you should never have a discussion about Israel-Palestine without mentioning Gaza. Right? Mm -hmm. It's convenient not mm -hmm. to mention Gaza. Uh, but the last time I went to Israel, I went uh, to Gaza. I couldn't go as foreign minister for security reasons, but I went last time. Now, two things become very clear. One, the absolutely miserable lives that are being uh, led there. Uh, There's a massive humanitarian issue. But there is a massive political issue as well, uh, Javier. The massive change since 2002 is that Palestine is divided in an absolutely fundamental way. And remember, it's at the heart of the notion of a two-state solution that it's a contiguous um, landmass. Okay. Now, the Gaza thing, I think, is a real, is real. And whether we like it or not, the withdrawal from Gaza, which wasn't properly coordinated and wasn't properly done with the Palestinians, has led to a very powerful narrative within the Israeli psyche about what happens when land is withdrawn from. And if one neglects that in thinking about withdrawal from the West Bank, we're going to kid ourselves about what is politically sellable in, in uh, Israel. Javier, if we, if we, let me, let me just Javier, if we continue, this will occupy the oh, entire, Can I entire evening. But let, let me, yes, just okay. briefly. No, please. Very briefly. We are going to have to deal with the Muslim brothers. Yes or no? Yes. They, are, they have come out of the election in Egypt. We have not gone through all these things and at the end said that we are not going to deal with Egypt. Hamas will evolve by the Muslim brothers. Therefore, we'll have to deal with the Hamas in a different manner than what we have left in the, we'll deal with them in the past because they will evolve. The fact that they cannot be already in Syria is a very important that they want to change and be somewhere else because in Syria they are not like it or they, they don't like to be in Syria. All these things are going to take place. And I think um, the moment of talking about gas and the West Bank, probably that will be a, a discussion that belongs to the past. Okay, let's go. Thank you both for your candor and, uh, and the depth of that discussion. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Sherry Hakimi. I'm a second year Master in Public Policy student here at HKS. Thank you both for joining us. Um, with regards to the talks next week with Iran, between the P5 plus one and Iran, uh, some people are defining success as a concrete commitment from Iran regarding its nuclear energy program. Others are defining it as a commitment for another meeting. Um, how would you define success? Myself. Success, success for me is that Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon. No, but success for the next, next Friday's meeting. Ah, for the next Friday's meeting? Mm. That it will be another. <laughs> <laughs> for I me, agree. that will be success. Okay. David. I, I, I agree. So Sherry, Sherry has done her second year project, her PAE project, on this issue. Those were impossibly brief responses. What's your follow-up? You must have a follow-up question. <laughs> I actually would agree that the best commitment that you can ask for is another meeting. Um, I would ask what process would you recommend for uh, High Representative Ashton to follow in these talks? I would, well, she hasn't asked me anything, so I, I don't want to give recommendations, but uh, I would recommend uh, to be as uh, tenacious as she's going to have a better help from the United States. They are going to be an important personality in the United States at the table. That will change uh, also the, the, the game of the Iranians uh, on some issues. Uh, first thing that. Second, I think we have to begin to create the conditions to understand what may be the end game. Okay and not to say, well, we do not talk about anything until you stop and you undo what uh, you have done. I think we have to begin preparing the ground to talk uh, in a certain manner about what may be the end game. And uh, 
provided uh, this is a negotiation like any other. And we were close to do that, close to do that, in two, two occasions. In one occasion, it was uh, impossible because we didn't agree at the end, we ourselves, the group of the countries that I represented, and the other, the last one, because we agreed on something and then the Supreme Leader didn't agree. Uh, the last meeting that took place in Geneva was a success. And it became a non-success. I wouldn't say a failure, but a non-success. Just briefly, you asked about process. I think that uh, if I were Cathy Ashton, I would get each of the representatives of the six nations to say the same thing. The Iranians need to hear from the Russians and the Chinese as well as from us the same message. And it needs to be consistent between public and private. And if at the end of the meeting the Iranians go away thinking these guys have got their act together and they mean it, that will be quite an important preparatory stage. Because remember, one of the dangers is that we come out of the meeting and the Iranians say, well, we got different messages from the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans and the Brits. And that's a very dangerous situation. Yes, please. My name is, my name is Effie Michelle. I'm a first year student here. Given US spending cuts in defense and the ongoing financial crisis in Europe, what does the military balance for NATO look like in the next five to 10 years? Is it relying more on Southeast Asian capabilities, on Turkey, on the BRICS? NATO. NATO. No, I don't see NATO relying on the BRICS. That would be a contradiction, I think. They get to rely on the, on the members of, the, of NATO, and among them is Turkey, no doubt about that, which is an important military force. But I think that one of the, one of the ideas that I had in mind, I, I had in mind, because I don't have it in mind any longer because I cannot implement it, but uh, is to take advantage of the crisis in order to get a better organization internally of the European Union and military matters. We have uh, an enormous scope to do better on military capabilities. And uh, somebody has to do it now, prepare it now the ground for that, not wait until the crisis is over. This is the moment which we have to save, in a way, and we have to organize better our capabilities and I think it's possible. We have the instrument to do that. We don't have the political will to do it. But we have the instrument to do it if the political will were there. Well, America spends more than the next 14 countries combined on its uh, military spending. We're not short of hardware. Uh, we, there's plenty of waste, but NATO doesn't suffer from uh, shortages. There's, there is an issue about European uh, defense spending. But, uh, defense Secretary Gates made this very powerful point at the end of his uh, tenure of office. So there are, I think, bigger issues for the Europeans than there are for the uh, Americans, but I don't think the military are cash starved. And assuming that the Afghan war does wind down, then there are pretty big savings as well to be had. The United States is spending over 4% of its GDP on national defense. I think all but um, three other NATO countries are spending below 2%. The largest European country, okay. Germany, 1.1 or 2%. Doesn't Germany have a fundamental self-interest obligation to lead a revival of European defense capacity? Why should the Americans do all the work in NATO? Yeah, I think, look, the, the, the German question is a historic question that's been posed in, you know, over the centuries, and it's going to be posed again. And the irony is that you know, the whole of Europe is asking for Germany to be stronger and more um, sort of tougher in its uh, leadership role. So. I think that is a, a big question, but it's a, he, for obvious reasons of history, there is a tendency for uh, Germany to want to be harmed less, and that leads it towards um, a, a view of security that's pretty minimalist, I would say. I think that, uh, I don't know how many questions are left, but I would say something about Germany. I shouldn't, but uh, I would say, I think that Germany now has a fear a concern about having to lead. And Germany is afraid of having the responsibility to lead. And that is the problem which we are living today. We need the leadership, they fear to have the leadership, and they have a big debate, internal debate, uh, which has to do a lot with history and with the 
I, I tell you a story which for me was fascinating. Uh, we were with the Chinese one day and uh, with a, a, a very young parliamentarian from the Bundestag and with the Chinese, and I was there by chance. And uh, he was asked, uh, why do you don't act more uh, dramatically, economically, etc., in the moment in which we are living? And they said, my grandmother, what first sister said, I am 29 years of age. I am parliamentarian. I've never seen inflation in my life. I live all my life without inflation. But my grandmother told me that inflation was terrible. And I believe my grandmother, I have not changed a single lynch, even if my experience in life has been the opposite. And this is, unfortunately, this is true still. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I pleasure to be in such distinguished company. Uh, my name is Michael Kanyang, and I'm a student at Harvard Business School and formerly an Iran desk officer at the State Department. Um, so I wanted to push the panel um, a little bit on the Iran issue. Um, more specifically, you know, the, the bizarre foxtrot between Iran and the Western powers over the dual track approach has been persisting over the last decade and even a little bit longer. So do you believe that the political dynamics are such that a final deal could be struck with Iran at this time? And if not, what needs to change? Is it Khamenei? Mm. Is it the role of Russia and China in the global energy markets, etc.? Mm. I don't think it's going to be struck at this stage, if, you, if by that you mean now? Within this process, without, under these political dynamics. Uh, I don't think it'll happen this year, uh, but could, in a, it could, is it a realistic ambition for a second Obama administration to see this issue resolved diplomatically? I would say yes. And that, it's not about regime change, but it's about um, clarity, consistency, Firm, firm but not macho is the absolute key to dealing with uh, Iran. And I think it is doable if you line up the, the economic, the political, and the regional. And it's the regional that's going to be the most difficult, I'm afraid. You may think that the nuclear question is, is tricky. But actually, in the formula of Iran asserting its rights but fulfilling its responsibilities, there is enough common ground. My biggest fear is about the relationship, is the regional relationships, because Iran is undoubtedly a source of regional destabilization, undoubtedly. But equally, there are a number of the Sunni Arab states, mm -hmm. notably in the Gulf, who absolutely hate the Iranians, with a vengeance that goes beyond geopolitics, and sorry to say it, goes to the heart of who's a real Muslim. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very dangerous situation. But if you talk to anyone, um, if you talk to people in a number of the countries of the Gulf about how they view the Shia, they view them as second-class Muslims. And until we figure out a way through that, <coughs> that, that, that puts the nuclear thing in a rather, it makes it seem rational. And the consequences of that, <coughs> what uh, has been said, is that uh, Iran has to choose between being a movement of the Shia or being in a state. If they decide to be in the state, yeah. you can deal with the state in a much better manner. Much, we know how to deal with the state. If you have a movement that wants to occupy parts of the Bahrain and parts of the Kuwait and parts uh, of mobilize those people and Hezbollah, etc., you want to keep on having influence by proxies. This is a completely different story. And that has to be clarified. I think that this under the table will be part of the or the discussion, or the conversation that we have to have with them. I would thank you for your question. I was the American negotiator of, this, of the sanctions resolutions against Iran between 05 and early 08. Here's what I fear. I fear we're not going to be patient enough, we, the Americans. You can see what's going to happen. This is going to be protracted, these negotiations, as David and Javier know. Very difficult. And you know, if we go a, a month or two, I think Many people in our society will say, diplomacy can't work. Mm. We've got to turn to the military option. Mm -hmm. We Americans have to be very smart. <laughs> we need to defeat the Iranians and their nuclear weapons ambitions, but we can only get there, I think, multilaterally, relying on our friends in Europe especially, but patience. That might mean staying at the diplomatic table long enough to get the job done, but as David has rightly said, not long enough in a naive way that Iran runs out the clock. 
Where that balance is, it's going to be very tricky for President Obama, and I really admire the fact he's willing to go into these <coughs> conversations. We haven't had a sustained conversation with him on any issue in 30 years since the Jimmy Carter administration. That's how critical this moment is starting next Friday. That's a great question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Steve. Um, I wanted to elaborate more on this Iran thing, but not from the standpoint that I've heard it brought up in, in these, uh, these recent discussions that I see more that it's not necessarily that they're uh, going for a nuclear weapon, but that they're on the border of a very powerful nation, namely Russia. And uh, I think that the, the real issue here is not necessarily that we fear they're going from 20% enriched uranium to 90 somehow um, in any short period of time, but that there is a, a financial system that's collapsing. The European Union is not in the worst crisis of the European Union, but the worst crisis of, of humankind, and it, it is collapsing. And I think that that is really the driver of these war, um, war pushes for Iran, for Syria, um, for now North Korea. I really don't think that this has anything to do with, with what we would really consider um, you know, stopping a humanitarian crisis, like we said in Libya, but really with creating a world war, like uh, how the Balkans were, were, were used in that same similar fashion. And you, you look at, at what's happened in the Middle East um, since the Sykes-Picot, and it becomes pretty, uh, pretty obvious that the role of the British Foreign Office in getting the United States tied up into these um, you know, long and draining... You're referring to the First World War. Right. Sykes-Picot, 1916. Right. So your question is, is there an international conspiracy of these great powers to provide, to well, get into I, war for economic reasons? Well, yeah, I mean, I think everything's economic. Uh, from, from the way that um, it's pretty obvious that, you know, our recent deployment of Michael McFaul as the, the, um, the you know, ambassador to Russia, and his first words before even getting uh, accepted were that he doesn't know anything about Pushkin or... Russian diplomacy, but really he knows how to overthrow governments. Okay. I, I think that's pretty... I think that's a fair, that's a complete distortion of Ambassador McFall, but I'll just... We got the drift, drift of your question. Gentlemen, do you agree or disagree? Uh, I, without understanding everything, to tell you the truth, I tend to disagree more than to agree. <clears throat> Look, you can't get 250,000 people to come and stand in minus 22 degrees temperature by being a professor of uh, insubordination or uh, whatever it was you said about Ambassador McFall. I mean, the truth about the last 18 months in politics, whether in Russia or in the Arab world, is not about economics, it's about politics. And what you've seen in the last 18 months is politics coming back into the equation. And I mm. think that that is the most significant thing. What's happening in my view is that we're, we're in the middle of an era of radical democratization by which I don't just mean electoral democratization, but the democratization of relationships, not just between people, but between states. Uh, you're seeing an opening up that is revolutionizing access to information, uh, and better education means that people can use that information. And so the bar of legitimacy for the exercise of power has been raised both in the undemocratic world and in the democratic world. And honestly, the, 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 the it would be lovely to think that Britain was as powerful as you suggest, but I fear that the, even the best brains of the Foreign Office can't manage the conspiracies that you've suggested. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, please. Right, um, sir? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was his turn next. So my name, thank you first of all for being here. I really appreciate your company. And my name is Graham Moore. I'm the founder of a nonprofit that focuses on promoting investment in Somaliland, northern Somalia. And anyway, I just wanted to address and expand a little bit on your, your comment about how politics and reality can somehow push in very different directions. So I think that probably the biggest failure of American foreign policy has been the Manakian worldview that policymakers and political leaders have promoted in our national discourse. I think it's really important to note that as we discuss Iran and Israel in this forum in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we have a national election going on in which Iran is being portrayed as a fanatical nation um, with regards to which the concepts of mutually assured destruction are completely irrelevant. 
this this dialogue has a lot of parallels with the same kind of rhetoric that was used during Vietnam when people discussed how the Vietnamese, because they were Buddhists, did not value life in the same way that we do. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm not finished. Well, sir, could you just get to your question? Yes, I can get to us. my we question. Just have about, we have five minutes left. I think that our politics are making, are concealing a lot of the truths about what our foreign policy goals should be and what they have been in the past. And my question is, what are America's real interests in foreign policy? I honestly don't think Afghanistan and Iran and Israel are worth a lot of the time they get. And as Alex DeWall pointed out in his recent op-ed, time and attention is a very scarce resource for policymakers. And the last thing I'd say is, how can we even discuss what America's interests are if we're not having an honest discussion about what America's values are and the impacts of our actions in the world over the past four decades. Thank you very much. Well, I think we are in a place where we discuss everything. This is an open university, good brains around the table, around the chairs, uh, and I hope that everything can be discussed. Uh, so I don't see any reason why we have to put into question uh, everything. We have uh, places where we can discuss. I mean, we are doing today that. Uh, two foreigners are giving lessons to the United States here. <laughs> so it's quite uh, quite an uh, achievement. <laughs> so um, God bless the Kennedy School. Uh, uh, two Thank points, uh, just, just briefly. One, the, the question is about what's the bandwidth of politicians, and are we spending our time on the wrong things? It seems to me that in an interdependent world, which is what we live in, you've got foreign policy, is about the global commons and about common problems. And the global commons is a security commons, an ecological commons, mm -hmm. a financial and, ec and economic uh, commons uh, as well. The challenges are breaches to order. So actually, I think that the stakes on the non-proliferation treaty are high with the Iranian issue, and they deserve a lot of attention. The yeah, OK. The, the, the issue of Palestinian justice and is a very big issue, and it's deserving, I would say, of more attention than it gets. Um, so my, my fear is that it's the, it, it, the acute crises obscure the chronic ones. And the danger at the moment, actually, is that Israel-Palestine is too difficult to handle, so it doesn't get talked about at all. <laughs> and that's the issue at the moment. Now, let me just mention, you, you mentioned Somaliland. It shouldn't be allowed to be lost completely. I mean, in the midst of the unspeakable difficulties in Somalia, there is a small part of Somalia up in the northeast, Somaliland, which is pretty peaceful, certainly by Somali standards, and pretty democratic, certainly by Somali standards. Quite a lot of Somalilanders live in uh, parts of the uh, UK, not in my constituency as it happens. Now, there's a really interesting issue, which is how do, does the self-determination of those people get taken forward? They often came to me and said, we want you uh, as Britain to be sponsoring independence for Somaliland. And I said to them, look, with the best will in the world, the worst thing that could happen is for us to be your campaign managers for uh, uh, independence, because it will arouse all the suspicions of the rest of uh, Africa. The sad thing is, they can't get other Africans to take seriously their concerns, because the rest of Africa is, is very worried about what's the precedent that's set for breaking up countries. Now, one interesting point, will the creation of South Sudan change some of that dynamic? I don't know, but the, the truth is the Somali landers as part of Somalia have got a very bleak future. As a potentially independent state, they've got something to play for. Thanks for your question. And listen, I support you on one thing you said. Um, I actually think there's a bipartisan consensus emerging in Washington and Iran. Most of our, our president and Governor Romney both have, I think, have an almost identical policy. They believe Iran is rational that you can negotiate as well as apply pressure. There's only one candidate who's essentially said that Iran is in a rational government. That's, that's uh, Rick Santorum. So I, I think there's some hope here that we might be able to fashion a sensible American policy, bipartisan on Iran, but thank you. Last question, I apologize for those of you who've been waiting. We, we only have one time for one more question. It's right here. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Isaac Diwan, I teach uh, economics at the Kennedy School. Uh, moving a little bit to the Arab world, to the Arab Spring, we should talk about it. Uh, it would be really interesting to hear your opinion on, on the causes, and you start talking a little about it. And also perhaps in, in the spirit of candor here, you know, you've been there, 
real politics and all that. Why has, has uh, the West and NATO countries supported these autocrats? Uh, you know, they were very repressive, anti-democratic, and all that for, for, for so long. It'd be really interesting to hear it from you, you since you've been there and we can learn from you. Isaac, thank you very much. That's a good question. I think that uh, at, uh, for a long time, or for some time, we have given uh, more weight in our international relations to stability than the freedom of people. Now, it's very trivial to say this, but it entails a lot of consequences, because uh, you have to be able to govern a situation of transformation and we know that is very difficult as we see it. That we are seeing now is a, a revolution in which the revolutionary people have no power. Okay? The ones who <laughs> came to the street have no power now. And the, the ruling class is the same ruling class of the past. The Muslim brothers in Egypt have been there, even their leaders, for years and years and years, as old as Mubarak. So the youngest of the people who are disappeared from the picture. So um, I, I claim uh, and I say, I don't claim, I say that uh, we have uh, played our cards probably not well, or not right, by maintaining in power for reasons of stability in a very complicated uh, zone for too long a time, people that didn't deserve it. Uh, the second question first, diplomats deal with governments. And when you deal with governments, you have to deal with them almost whatever stripe uh, they are. And sometimes remarkable things happen. I would never have believed that the Burmese government would have allowed the, even the limited experiments in democracy that have happened, the return of Aung San Suu Kyi. But we deal with governments. And so when we went to meet Mubarak, we dealt with him. Now, you also try and have a foreign policy that engages with people. That's why... I'm sure we both would do meetings at Cairo University or, or go to Al Ajar or elsewhere. Um, but the, the simple truth is that you have to deal with the institutions of state power. Now, when do you cross the line between dealing with institutions of state power and supporting institutions of state power? That's essentially the, uh, the, the, the difficulty. And I think the truth is that um, there's a very mixed record. I mean, actually, I think it was when you were at the State Department, there was this push to try... I mean, I think Condi Rice went to uh, Cairo and said, we've been yeah. supporting tyrants for far too long. We're going to have to... Uh, um, we're gonna ha we, we want to support, uh, support the people, not just support the government. Now, what's interesting, actually, is that the revolutions or the revolts that have happened have been nothing to do with the West at all. These have been homegrown revolts uh, against... And this is the first part of your question, against kleptocracy, corruption... Um, inequality, uh, but also a sense that national mission and national pride had been completely lost. I mean, I think Egypt is the most profound example of this. This is a 3,000-year-old civilization. I don't know whether you, you know whether you would agree with this, but my sense is that people felt the country was being led nowhere. And in the end, it became a matter of person. There was a personal affront and a national affront that led to this uh, boiling over. Uh, triggered in part by Tunisia, but uh, what happened in Tunisia, but also by mm. a sense that the regime was completely without uh, mor morality or legitimacy, and empowered by information more than by anything else. And I think that's significant. I don't think it is 1848, 1848, the European revolutions where one elite was replaced by another. I think it's something more than that, but it's not 1989. It's a, it, 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 there's quite a lot of the old guards still finding their way back into the... Uh, that's what we're into saying. the system, but it's happening in a different context, and that's why I think this notion that it's a radically democratic age is quite important, because the genie of open flows of information can't be put back in the bottle. Alas, we have run out of time. It's been a remarkable mm. opportunity to hear from two great and very thoughtful mm. leaders. Please join me in thanking Javier Solana and David Miller. <laughs>